Today I'm joined with over 100 Bramptonians. Everyone say hi really loud. <laughs> they do exist, even though you can't see them. Um, what we're gonna do today is have a very in-depth conversation with Sarada Perry, the former speechwriter for Barack Obama, the President of the United States. What we're gonna do now is I'm gonna call up Mayor Jeffrey, who's gonna say a few, uh, few words to open up this event. I want to uh, take this moment to thank Ryerson Leadership Lab, who made this event possible, uh, and bringing Serato over as well. Uh, I also would like to thank Brampton Focus, our media and broadcast partner, who are making this live feed possible, and the lighting, and all the cameras, and a lot of the tech. Uh, and also the staff here at Alderley for helping us put this event uh, together with uh, some very great people and, and local residents. So with that, I will hand the mic over to Mayor Jeffrey. everybody and thank you for coming. Um, I'm really pleased you're here uh, for the second in our speaker series. Hopefully this evening will inspire you, give you great ideas. Uh, I want to thank uh, the uh, former Premier Bill Davis for being with us tonight, uh, my colleague Martin Medeiros, uh, Raj Graywall, Harinder Mali. It's nice to have some elected officials here and they certainly will appreciate some of the conversation we're going to hear about speech writing. As someone who has given many, many speeches, the uh, value of someone who helps you put together a really great speech cannot be understated. I have learned many things over the years, uh, what a bad speech is, what a great speech is, and I know that uh, you're gonna hear tonight about someone who worked for an individual who helped uh, shape many important discourses ab uh, about having hope for the future, to uh, ri get people to rise up and be passionate about their cities, and their communities and their country. So uh, I know that in my case, I've learned that telling a story helps to make a speech come to life. Repetition helps. And certainly finding a way to reach out to people and give them hope. Uh, so I want to thank uh, our guest tonight, Sarita. Thank you very much. And Kareem, who I knew in another life when I was at the province. Uh, I appreciate them here and bringing s something interesting to Brampton. This is part of a series. We're going to try and bring some other interesting speakers here to have you think bigger and bolder about what Brampton can and will be. Uh, I want a better Brampton, I hope you do too, and tonight is here to expand what we believe can be the future of our city. So thank you very much for being here today. This thank live you, uh, your worship stream is Jeffrey. brought to you by Brampton Focus. Sorry. We are a leading community-based media group in Canada. Learn more about building an audience at bramptonfocus.ca slash engage. So again, we want to thank our partners at Brampton Focus for making this possible. For those of you watching at home on the live feed, you can shoot us questions. So if you have a question, just directly comment to the video that, you s that we're sharing off the mayor's page. I will be reading those questions for our panelists throughout the night. Uh, with that, I'm going to now introduce our two guests who are here today uh, to speak about speech writing under uh, President Barack Obama. First and foremost, we have Kareem Bardizi. Kareem, say hello. Yeah. Everyone put your hands together for Kareem. <laughs> Kareem. Kareem is a public service leader who has worked at the intersection of public policy, politics, journalism, and academia for the last 15 years. He is a distinguished vis visiting professor and special advisor to the president at Ryerson University in Toronto. He is also the co-founder of the Ryerson Leadership Lab who have helped us put on this event today. He was previously deputy principal secretary for the Premier of Ontario, the Honorable Kathleen Wynne, and served as executive director of policy for Premiers Wynne and Dalton McGuinty. He has worked as a journalist, as an editorial writer at the Globe and Mail, and as an editorial assistant at Slate Magazine, and was a diversi diversity fellow with the Greater Toronto Civic Action Alliance. He has taught narrative and leadership at the University of Toronto School of Public Policy and Governance and has a BA from McGill University and an MPP from Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. Once again, put your hands uh, together for Kareem. I, I hope my mom's not listening, otherwise she's gonna think I did nothing in my life. So thanks, Kareem. Uh, Sarada Perry, who's our special guest here from the United States, is a writer and communication strategist who has helped top leaders and thinkers from Fortune 50 CEOs to the President of the United States to inspire and persuade audiences. She was a special assistant to the President and senior speechwriter for President Barack Obama. Prior to joining the White House, she was a principal at 
the aptly named West Wing Writers, where she worked with corporate, political, and nonprofit clients on speeches, op-eds, and message strategy. A recovering policy wonk, Sada works on Capitol Hill covering education and healthcare policy for former Louisiana Senator Mary Landrieu. She started her career as a high school English teacher in New Orleans through Teach for America. She holds a BA from Tufts University and a Master of Public Policy from Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Kareem. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Just Kieran. Uh, thank you, Mayor Jeffrey, your worship, for uh, having us here today. Uh, or as, we, as I think the mayor is known in town, uh, Mayor Linda Kaur Jeffrey. Um, thank you so much for, uh, to Mr. Davis for honoring us with your presence today. Thank you to the elected officials who are here, uh, who the mayor already mentioned. And also I'd like to point out uh, uh, Dean Pam Sugaman, Dean of Arts at Ryerson University, who's here on behalf of Ryerson as well. Uh, and thanks for joining us, uh, both in person and those who are watching live on the, uh, premier, on the uh, mayor's Facebook page. Um, also like to say that this is the second event that Ryerson has done as part of the Mayor's Speaker Series, and we're very excited about the partnership uh, that Ryerson is doing in Brampton in partnership with the Sheridan College to put down more roots of learning and leadership here in the city of Brampton. <coughs> I think we've been brought together today because uh, there's a bit of a decline of trust in our institutions, and people are getting worried. We look down to the south, uh, a country that uh, a lot of us uh, have fond affections for, close ties of friendship, of uh, neighborliness, of uh, trade, and we're concerned. We're seeing the uh, uglier side of an America that we thought had moved on. But there's also hope. Americans from all political stripes are coming together and they're deciding to speak out. They're wanting to engage on the issues. They're wanting to learn about the issues, speak out, get organized, and take action against some of the uh, negative political tides that we're seeing. Um, and Canada, and frankly, isn't uh, immune from any of those tides. Um, there's the potential for some of these tides to come to us. And so we, too, have to learn the issues, come together, reach across boundaries, speak out, and get organized. And that's what we're trying to do is in part at the Ryerson Leadership Lab. Uh, so we're very pleased to be able to do this together with you uh, tonight. Uh, because sometimes, despite the best goodwill of leaders, uh, sometimes they're more likely to talk to each other than to the people. And when the leaders fail to talk to the people and, talk to each, and start talking more to each other, that's when you get some of the negative things that we've been seeing south of the border. Uh, so we need to develop leaders who are going to, again, do the same things, learn the issues, reach across boundaries, speak out, and get organized. And that's what we're trying to do with the Ryerson Leadership Lab. One of the, things we're tr one of the ways we're trying to do that is by bringing um, people from across the world who have uh, worked in leadership or worked serving leaders um, so we can learn their lessons, so we can learn about uh, their stories from their successes and their failures to see how we can grow as leaders. And um, that's why we have uh, uh, Sarada here with us tonight. So thank you very much, Sarada, for coming. Um, now, Sarada, I don't know if you know this, but I met you before you met me. Uh, <laughs> this was, uh, it was 2006 uh, at Harvard Kennedy School, uh, and I was a first-year student. Sarada was a second-year uh, student. She was running the student newspaper at the time. And if you remember in 2006 in the United States, uh, there was a, a war that the US was uh, doing in uh, Iraq that was not going that well. Many of us will know that the war in Afghanistan was not going that well either at that time. And I was interested, uh, Sarada was helping to run the newspaper and I uh, went to a meeting about the newspaper and Sarada started talking about what the, what the responsibilities of a journalist were in wartime. How you had to be uh, deeply researched, unapologetic, and speak the truth. Uh, I'm Canadian, I'm a bit apologetic, so I just left the room and <laughs> went to another club <laughs> and didn't get involved. But I saw through that that Sarada was clearly a person of uh, deep values, uh, and I'm lucky that uh, she's now a friend. Um, and we brought her, to her here today because after she did that work uh, at the Kennedy School, she went on to become a health policy advisor in the U.S. Senate. Uh, she went on to uh, become a speechwriter, culminating, as uh, just Kieran said, to be a senior speechwriter for President Obama. She's also the mother of a five-month-old daughter, Zia, who's here tonight with her husband, Nassim. Um, and we're so honored to have you here tonight. Thank oh, you. Thanks for having me. So the title that we gave to this event is uh, A Daisy in the White House. And uh, I think a question that I actually don't know the answer to fully myself, and I think a lot of people probably have, is how does uh, a South Asian American uh, uh, woman, a girl growing up, and now a woman uh, growing up in New Jersey, find yourself in the White House? 
I have no earthly idea. Because uh, uh, when I was that little girl, I definitely did not imagine being in the White House and now being with you all. So um, first of all, thank you all for having me. Thank you, Mayor. This is really, this is really great. Um, so I uh, grew up in the Brampton of New Jersey. It's called Edison. Um, I see lots of nodding heads. Yeah. So um, uh, surrounded by lots of folks from our community. And um, uh, I was around me, as maybe this is a familiar story for some of you, but uh, I knew a lot of doctors and engineers. Uh, computer scientists, um, uh, not so, not so many, not so many writers, not so many uh, people who are in public service, and um, that was definitely sort of in the ethos of the air. But um, but my parents uh, encouraged uh, encouraged me to sort of pursue what I loved, and so um, it was very clear early on that I was definitely not going to medical school, and so um, <laughs> uh, my grades in science made that made that. Uh, uh, a sure thing. And so um, I always loved politics. Um, I came from a really political family. My parents are hardcore Democrats, and um, from you know basically the moment they came to America, they were they were on board with the with, with the Democrats. And so I, I grew up in a really politically engaged household. Um, I went to college and I majored in in political science and English at Tufts. Um, and I knew I wanted. I always loved writing, but I, I didn't really know how to if that was a job, um, other than journalism, which I, I didn't actually want to be a journalist because I, was, I felt myself too opinionated. And so um, I, uh, after college, I did a program called Teach for America, which um, I don't know if Canada has an equivalent, but um, it's a program that recruits college graduates to uh, become teachers in underserved communities, under-resourced school districts. So I was sent to New Orleans, um, and I taught high school English for a couple of years in the biggest uh, high school in New Orleans. And while there, you know, one of the reasons I did it was because I wanted to sort of see the policies I had been studied in school, how they were actually affecting real people. And I, I, in that experience, was so frustrated by sort of the systemic inequalities that led our students to a situation where they were not getting the kind of education that I got, you know, and I found it so frustrating and disheartening. So I decided I wanted to sort of work a little bit more I directly in policy in the, with the naive hopes that maybe I could affect broader change. Um, so I worked for a nonprofit that worked with state legislators for a couple of years, um, and then, uh, which you know, are, are, I guess, the equivalent of our provincial governments. Um, and then um, I went to the Kennedy School of Government, um, where I met Kareem. And while there, I did more writing. Um, but was kind of getting deeper and deeper steeped into, into policy. And like Kareem said, I, I left um, the Kennedy School and went to go work for a senator. Um, she was a moderate Democrat from the South, from Louisiana, which was a state where I had taught. And I worked on health healthcare and education policy primarily, including uh, what is now known as Obamacare, for those of you guys who are paying attention to our healthcare politics down South. Um, so I worked on Obamacare on the policy side for this senator. But the whole time I was there, I still knew I wanted to write. Um, and uh, and so I, but and I wasn't loving what I was doing um, on the Hill. And so a friend of mine introduced me to, she, you know, she actually one day said to me, "I think you might like speech writing." And I said, "Like, is that a job?" Because um, because at that point my only understanding of speech writing was from the show The West Wing, and I thought that. Um, <laughs> That you know, presidents had speechwriters, but that didn't at the time. You know, George W. Bush was speechwriter, so was the president. So I wasn't going to be his speechwriter, um, and uh, I just didn't. I didn't think it was. A, just didn't know it was a job. So, so my friend said, you know, I know this guy. Um, he's a he's a speechwriter. He has this firm called West Wing Writers. You should talk to him. So I did, and over the course of a couple of years, um, I got to know the folks at this firm, um, who had been uh, President Clinton's speechwriters. And then after the Clinton administration ended, they started their own firm. And so they hired me in 2010 after Obamacare was done, and, uh, after it had passed. And uh, I was there for about four and a half years. While I was there in 2012, um, we, so our political parties hold conventions during presidential election years to nominate our candidates. So in 2012, for President Obama's re-election, I worked at our Democratic convention that summer, um, or that fall actually, where um, there were 14 speechwriters who were corralled into the referee's locker room of the Charlotte Hornets Arena to write speeches, about oh, more than 100 speeches for the, for the convention. And while I was there, um, the person who had become the president's chief speechwriter in the second term, Cody Keenan, saw some of my work. Um, we had known him from the Kennedy School, um, so you know we knew each other vaguely. Um, and then a couple years later in 2014, while I was still at Wesleyan Writers, he called me one day and said, hey, you want to write speeches for the president? And I said, are you kidding me? <laughs> and, uh, and, so, uh, and so then I got lucky enough to go to the White House. So, so when did you 
kind of figure out that you could make your career with words? Um, I think West Wing writers did it for me. You know, I think they took a chance on me seeing that I had some raw writing talent and a real passion for policy and history and literature and sort of all of the, the things that make one a, a good speechwriter. And, um, and they, I think, w when I realized I could do that, it was sort of, it was almost as though um, I met sort of kindred spirits, but also I figured out that this was a job that fit the way that my brain worked, if that makes any sense. And, um, so it was, it was liberating to stumble on that. But I didn't become a speechwriter until I was 30. So for all you young people whose parents are hounding you to figure out what you, what you should do with your life, you have time. So, <laughs> um, so you got a call. Did it say wet the White House on the caller ID? No, I mean, it, it was. It was <laughs> 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 no, I, I guess it must have been Cody's cell. Um, and so no, I would have been terrified. I probably would have just dropped my phone and run away. <laughs> um, so you say yes? Yeah. You, you can only say yes when you, you get it. You can only say yes, by. although I think in the moment I was so shocked and I kind of thought I was being punked. And so I, um, I think I, I, I sort of mangled my words and said something to the effect of I have to call you back. I don't know why I said that because obviously I was going to take the job, but yeah. Um, and you did? I did. And, and so you started? I started around on, on a Monday? Um, and I, yeah, I started on a Labor, Labor Day 2014. Our Labor Day is in uh, September. I don't know. What, yeah, I feel like in Canada, every day is Labor Day, but um, for <laughs> <laughs> not, not so much in the US. Uh, so yeah, that fall of 2014, and I stayed there until the end, um, until January of this year. So walk us through that first day. So That first day. You know, honestly, it's a blur. Um, it's like. It really is a blur. In fact, it's comparable to the blur of the first few days of parenthood for anybody who has, who is, I mean, you, does anybody remember the first few days of parenthood? No. Um, so it's a little bit like that. I mean, I remember that there was a lot of paperwork um, and it was, uh, you know, people were coming back from August recess. In August in Washington, D.C., everything kind of shuts down. Congress goes into recess. Everybody takes vacations, even if they don't work in government. And so we were just sort of coming out of that sleepy period. Um, I met, um, you know, my, my colleagues. Um, but I will tell you, so, so that afternoon, Cody, my boss, um, was incredibly kind and he walked me through the West Wing. So my office, um, I don't know if you guys have seen pictures of the White House, but sort of there's the White House and the West Wing almost looks like a trailer attached to the White House where, where all the senior staff work. It's actually, it's a, quite a small space. And then next to it is an enormous, gorgeous building called the Eisenhower Executive Office Building. And that's where most people who say they work in the White House, most of us worked there. And um, so Cody, who worked in the West Wing, had me come over and he t walked me around the West Wing just to get myself oriented. And he introduced me to a lot of the senior staff, to our communications director, to the chief of staff. That day, the president was leaving for uh, a foreign trip. I believe he was going to Estonia. And so, um, unbeknownst to me, Cody basically wound up, sort of wound our tour through the West Wing up into the outer Oval Office. So the Oval Office has kind of an ante room that, um, where the, his secretary sits. And we went there and he introduced me to the president's secretary. And then, and then Cody walks into the Oval Office. No one's there. And he says, come in, and I'm terrified, right? Like, I'm, me, a mere mortal, walking into the Oval Office. Like, me, a little Indian girl from Edison, New Jersey, should not be walking into the Oval Office. And um, he says, no, no, come on, come on. And President Obama ha always had apples on his, uh, his desk, not his main desk, but the coffee table. And uh, Cody says, take an apple. And I was like, I can't take an apple. <laughs> it's like, the sacred Obama apple. <laughs> And I took an apple and he says, just make sure you eat it later because a lot of people don't eat it and it will rot. It's a real <laughs> apple. And so, and so we're standing in the Oval and he, he pulls me to the side, like a side door and Marine One, which is the president's helicopter, is sitting on the South Lawn and it's going to take him to Andrews for the trip. And so we watched, on my first day, at the end of the day, we watched the president take off in Marine One from the South Lawn. It was the most extraordinary, I mean, Talk about not imagining that this is your life, you know? Um, I, I felt so unbelievably lucky in that moment. But it was, it was, it was a pretty cool. That part of the first day, I remember. <laughs> now, now, President Obama uh, what, hadn't interviewed you, hadn't checked your references himself or anything no, like that. No, I had no idea who uh, on earth I would so be, yeah. At, at a given point, uh, you met him? Yeah, so about a week later, when he came back from his trip, um, so every Friday, we would do something called the weekly tapings. Um, uh, the president, and I think this current president still does it, although I'm not paying that close attention, um, uh, our president and previous ones um, did what used to be called a, a weekly radio address. So the president would do a, a radio address recorded on Fridays and it would be um, delivered on, Saturday, you know, um, uh, broadcast on Saturdays for people to hear. And it would be about any number of topics, you know, the news of the week or 
Merry Christmas or whatever it was. And so we ch changed, the Obama administration changed the radio address into also a weekly web address so you could watch it online. And so he would tape them every Friday. So Cody said, this is a good time for you to meet him because he's doing these tapings. It's a Friday, he's, you know, it's a chill day, it's not too crazy. So he brings me to the, normally we, you, you do these tapings in various rooms. Um, and, the, and the operations of a place like the White House, and, and anybody who works in a big bureaucracy or you know, in government, you know, it's just the, the way that the people who work operations are able to accomplish things is stunning. So in the White House, we were doing a taping this day in, in a room called the State Dining Room which is a room in the main part of the White House. If you ever take a White House tour, you'll see it. Um, it's a gorgeous, open, huge uh, dining room. There's only one painting in there. It's of Abraham Lincoln, because his family, um, his estate said you could hang this painting in the White House, but only if, on the condition that it's the only painting in that room. So it's the sole painting. So they had set up the room for a couple of tapings. He was taping um, an, an ad, like a public service announcement um, that for a campaign we were doing to fight um, sexual assault on campuses. So he did that taping, and he was standing in one section of the room. Uh, as, uh, he was going to be standing in one section of the room. The first part of the taping he was doing was a weekly address, and he was sitting in, on another side of the room. So he finishes that taping, and I'm standing in the back of the room with Cody, and he walks over, and you know, President Obama's got this great saunter, right? So he saunters over to the other side of the room, and he looks over, and obviously he knows Cody, and he gives me this double take, like, who's that? And, um, and because everybody else in the room are people he knows, the recording guys, you know, uh, people he's familiar with, and then there's this random little Indian girl standing there. And um, so he kind of did a double take, and then he finished recording his ad, and then he walks over, and, uh, and then Cody says, you know, this is your newest speechwriter, Sarada. And uh, he shakes my hand, and um, there's a picture of this, of this event where it, it looks like he's a giant about to eat me because I'm pretty short, and he's really tall. Um, and, uh, and he said, where'd you come from? And I said, a, firm, a speech writing firm called West Wing Writers. And he said what I said when I first heard about it, which is, there's, a, there's speech writing firms? <laughs> and, and he said, it's called West Wing Writers. Isn't that us? Aren't we West Wing Writers? Um, and, uh, and then he sauntered off, and that was, that was my first meeting with President Obama. <laughs> and, and do you remember the first thing that you had to write for him? I do. Um, actually, it was about campus sexual assault, so I guess it must have been a week or two later, all the, uh, maybe a week later, um, the President and Vice President Biden launched a kind of, um, uh, sort of a, a, like a campaign to fight um, sexual assault on campuses that was affiliated with some programs that the Department of Education was going to start putting out um, to help combat this epidemic of sexual assault on campuses. And so we held this event in the East Room in the White House. And um, it was actually pretty intense, but, um, you know, because it's a obviously a very serious subject. There were a lot of rape survivors who were there. Um, and Pro Vice President Biden went first, and then President Obama spoke. And, um, there's nothing more terrifying than the first time you have to send your speech. First of all, you send it to his book the night before, which means you know he's going to see it. I mean, and that's just mortifying, right? And then the first time you have to send it to the teleprompter, because you're like, what if I sent my grocery list? Like, what if, <laughs> what if, I, what if I just sent that? I mean, it's so scary. Um, but anyway, so, so we go there, and I met the vice president speechwriter, who I, I had known who he was. But it turns out he was also Desi. Not only was he also the Desi, but he was a Telugu person like I am. And I was like, when did, who would have thunk, who would have thunk it that you know, two of the senior speechwriters in the White House would have been two Telugu people? It's kind of cool. <laughs> um, so what, tell, talk to us a bit about what a day in the life is like um, for, for a presidential speechwriter and when you actually engage one-on-one -on -one with the president? Sure, I mean, it varies. Um, so for most, as you might imagine, President Obama was a pretty busy guy. Um, and so we didn't, meet, I, we didn't meet with him for every single speech. Some of the bigger speeches, um, Cody might meet with him because Cody was a member of the senior staff and so they had regular senior staff meetings and he might get the information that we would need. And then on the back end, we might talk to the president if we needed it. But on a, on a given speech that, um, uh, you know, he, whether he was involved or not, uh, up front, we might meet with him, get his download. It might even be a situation where he's got a few speeches up on the calendar, so Cody would set it up that several speechwriters would be in the room and he would just kind of go down the line and tell us what he wanted in each speech. Um, and then, you know, we would typically get our assignments about a week out, that was about average, but sometimes it could be suddenly there's a speech you have to give tomorrow, sometimes, you know, there's a commencement speech three months away and you're going to get assigned it. 
And so about a week out, you know, you get the assignment. If it was a policy speech or really any speech, I would meet with the policy people in the building, um, uh, start doing my research. Uh, we had a research, um, uh, you know, full time. Our, sta our speech writing assistant was our assistant speech writer was our researcher. So we would get all this research together, start working on a draft. Um, Cody would edit it, and then we would circulate it around the building, which meant you know a listserv of 150 people would get this speech. To, to submit their edits. Now, not everybody would submit their edits, but you know you might get a lot. And then you basically had a day to manage the editing process, take some edits, not take others. But we had the lawyers looking at it, the fact checkers. We had an entire department devoted to fact checking. Think about that vis-a-vis -vis the current president. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and then, um, and then when, when it was all set, when we were pretty happy with it, then we would send it to the president's book which was basically his big book of homework that he got every night. And uh, President Obama was a night owl, and so he would make his edits overnight. If he wanted to talk to us, you know, we would get called in in the morning and sit with him as he would go through his edits. Um, but he would make his edits by hand, and then you, know, you would input them, and, and then you would go live. Is there a speech in particular that you are really proud of, that like, you really thought this really landed and this communicates not only the President's values, but my values? Um, gosh, there are a few. Um, you know, uh, last year, uh, in the fall of 2016, um, oh, was it, no, it was fall of 2015, sorry, so now I'm mixing up my years, but it was as the, as the campaign was getting, uh, 2015, sorry, the campaign was starting to get, the political campaign was starting to get pretty heated. Um, at this point, I believe Trump had already called for the Muslim ban. Um, things were getting pretty ugly um, in, our, in our politics already, it was, and it was a year before the election. And um, the president was going to be giving uh, a speech for a naturalization ceremony. So this is a ceremony when um, people become newly minted citizens, when they take the oath of citizenship to become American citizens. And he was going to be giving this speech at the National Archives, which is a building in Washington that, and, and an organization, it's part of the government, the National Archives, which um, ho houses all of our country's most important documents. The, you know, the Declaration of Independence and you know, our founding documents, as well as the, the papers of the presidents. And so he was going to be giving it in this sort of very meaningful place, um, giving a, a speech for these new citizens. And we thought this would be a great opportunity for the president to talk about what immigration has always meant to America and how immigrants are sort of uh, from, from the beginning part of our story because America is in fact a nation of immigrants. And, um, and so he want, you know, we ended up telling, I think, a really sort of compelling story about his vision of what America is and I think what a lot of Americans' idea of, of America is as a, as a country of immigrants and, we, and this sort of admitting that we ho oh, haven't always gotten it right, you know, whether it was the internment of the Japanese um, or the Chinese Exclusion Act. We haven't always gotten immigration right, but, um, but that every group is a str was a stranger once. You know, we were all from somewhere else uh, except for our indigenous Americans, our, our Native Americans. Um, and so it was, he did such a beautiful job with this speech. You know, we all worked on it. Um, he was obviously integral in, in writing it. And, um, but, uh, but because there was so much hostility in the air at the time, people were getting really nervous. And at the end, after that speech was done, um, a few of our Muslim American staffers emailed me to tell, tell me how much it meant to them that President Obama had given that speech. And, and that day, I was, I mean, there were so many days when I was really proud to work for him, but I was so proud to work for him that day. And, you know, the reaction we got from the public was so positive because I think people were really looking to him to kind of remind us who we were. It was, it was starting to get a little scary, and I think it was a, a really important moment. Well, in politics, it seems like sometimes the prevailing trend is to only communicate strength and to only show confidence. Yeah. And so, some, but sometimes you're saying in that instance, it was actually acknowledging the, the nation's shortcomings that made it a, 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 as powerful a speech as it was. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's actually, I think what separates President Obama's, um, not separates, I think his idea of American exceptionalism has often been attacked by the right wing in America because they claim that he doesn't think America is exceptional because he's willing to acknowledge where we've fallen short. But what I think is really powerful about President Obama's idea of America, one I agree with, is that 
he believes that what makes America exceptional is the fact that we make mistakes, we can admit them, and then we can find a way to move forward together. He has always believed that in sort of our, our original creed, um, that we are always trying to make a more perfect union. We will never get, we will never be perfect. We aren't perfect now, but we can always make it more perfect. And that our patri patriots are people who, you know, love their country enough to try to change it. And so um, we would always get heat for that from people, for admitting that something, you know, even in foreign countries, when we would say, look, here's, when, we would, when he would criticize other countries and be willing to say, look, here's where we've gone wrong too. But he thought that, I think he believes that strength, uh, if a country is strong enough to admit where it's gone wrong, um, then it, that, that's where its resilience lies. And, and not only was he really thoughtful about America and American history, he was also a pretty good writer himself. Actually, even before he entered politics, he'd entered a, written an acclaimed memoir. So what was it like to write, work for someone who can probably in some respects do his job, uh, your job better than you can? I mean, in all respects, not, not some respects. Um, we used to call him speechwriter in chief. Um, he is an extraordinarily beautiful writer and a really great editor and obviously somebody who's very thoughtful um, and, and knows what he wants to say. So I actually found it to be in some ways liberating because you know that no matter what, he's going to deliver something great. You know, he's not, if you write some crappy draft, um, he's not going to let it, he's not going to, ultimately what he delivers will be great. Um, it was intimidating because obviously he had really high standards. Um, fortunately, you know, we had a whole team that worked together. Um, my boss, Cody, is, was fantastic and, you know, had worked with the president for a long time so could help us shape shaped the speech into what he wanted. Um, but overall, it was actually just a really great um, writing experience. You know, to, it's, it's rare as a speech writer to get, to receive edits that you know are just better than anything you could have done. And so that was always um, really a remarkable gift and one I probably won't have again. But. And you weren't afraid of disappointing him or? Uh, you're perpetually afraid of disappointing him, yeah. <laughs> It's like you don't want to disappoint your dad, um, but in this case, he's the leader of the free world. Um, and uh, he, yeah, of course, you want him to be happy. And not only because you don't want to disappoint him because we loved and respected him so much, but you also, this was somebody who, you know, many of you here work in government. Our officials are busy people. You know, they're running around. They, um, you know, they have a million things to do, and they rely on their staff, whether you're the president or a mayor, or you, know, you, you rely on your staff to get things done so that your, your time isn't wasted. And so you don't, I, I always was worried, you know, uh, is this a good use of President Obama's time? Did I do a draft so that he doesn't need to spend tons of time editing it? Um, I think that as any good staffer, that's, that's your job to make their lives easier, so. Uh, ask a few more questions and you can start uh, getting your questions ready and we'll take some from the audience and online. Um, you mentioned your experience in literature and as a teacher, are there, were there certain books or writers that you thought you or used to use when you were drafting speeches or that served as inspiration? Well, so President Obama is a huge um, Abraham Lincoln fan. So, you know, all of his speechwriters read Lincoln and I have, you know, his, all of sort of Lincoln's collected works um, and, uh, you know, that I relied on often. Um, uh, there's a writer that I, that I know President Obama loves. Her name is Marilyn Robinson and I actually also love her. And so I um, often relied on her. Um, and you know, you just sort of try to, I guess I would always often seek inspiration everywhere. And as a writer in general, sometimes it doesn't come from other writing. So if I'm stuck, and for any of you guys who are writers, you know, if, you, if you've got writer's block, or, and sometimes it helps to sort of step away from the piece and look at inspiration from other forms of art, a beautiful painting, listen to a great song. You know, there are so many ways to sort of get your creative juices flowing. And often that involves just stepping away from the thing you're working on and, and looking elsewhere for inspiration. Um, you mentioned growing up in Edison and your family's democratic background. Do you think there was something, some value or something, some values that you held or something in your experience that you thought, I'm the only person who can bring this to this job? Mm, that's interesting. Um, well, I think, you know, I think our job really, our job was to convey the president's you know, vision and values. And in a way, I think um, having immigrant parents helps sort of, under, helps inform my understanding of President Obama's experience too, right? I mean, his dad um, immigrated from Kenya and, um, you know, he, he had that in his background as well. Um, but I also think that, um, at least in my view, you know, 
immigrants in America are some of the most patriotic people you'll ever meet. Like, I don't know anyone who's more patriotic than my dad, you know. Um, when I was, a, you know, in my teens, late teens, early 20s, and railing against, you know, government and protesting this and protesting that, and he would always say, America is the greatest country in the world because you can still do this. You know, this is why we came here. You can speak out against your government. You can protest, and you have the freedom to do whatever you want. And he really felt it because he, you know, uprooted his entire life to make a life in America. And so I think that that experience was actually really valuable um, um, as a writer. And I think it gives you a level of empathy, which is probably the most important quality you can have both as a leader and a writer, um, with, with people, uh, the ability to empathize with other people's experiences. Um, absolutely, so. absolutely. I think we have some questions from online. Just curious, is that yeah, correct? I'll start with a question online from Joey, who's a resident of Brampton, but watching from San Francisco, that liberal <laughs> wasteland. Uh, <laughs> Do you think our public leaders need to be thought leaders? Or do the writing teams such as yourselves do all the quote unquote thinking? Oh my gosh, yes. No, our public leaders are the thought leaders, or at least they ought to be. So if you, if as a speech writer you're also doing the thinking, then something is off. I mean, of course we're doing thinking, but I think the best speech writers are thought partners to our public leaders. And so our job is to help our leaders articulate their vision to the public um, and maybe clarify some points of it. But if you have to ask someone else why you're running for office, then you're probably in the wrong line of business, I think. So. Yeah, I mean, the core, having a core exactly. is really important, it's pretty, right? Pretty, pretty important, yeah. Politicians are often consumers of ideas, but they still need to have something there. Yeah, the there center. needs to be their yeah. own sort of vision. Yeah. Yeah. Another question here from Gerlene from Brampton. Um, in your experience going from New Jersey to where you are now um, and all the various jobs you've had, have you experienced any hurdles um, being a South Asian female? And how did you overcome them if you did? Um, I think so much, so many of the barriers that one experiences as a minority, as a woman, are, are almost, they're implicit. They're built, they're baked into our daily experiences. They're, they lie in the assumptions people made, or when you were in the third grade and too embarrassed to correct the teacher who said your name wrong, or, you know what I mean? These experiences just build and build, or if you're sexually harassed in the street, again and again, like every woman on earth is. Over time, I think these become not just barriers in society, but psychological barriers. Um, that's not to you know, say that I had some huge adversity to climb, but I just think that these are the things that um, erode our confidence and um, prevent us from kind of reaching for the next experience. Um, and I think I especially see that among my, my women friends, and I see, I've seen it in myself. Um, and the other piece of that, I think, in terms of barriers, we're just not having access to the networks. Of, you know, if I had wanted to be a doctor, um, I would have known how to do that because I knew a lot of doctors because I'm Indian. Um, but, um, uh, but, but trying to get into a field where I just didn't see a lot of people who looked like me um, or who came from my experience or um, that I felt like I could talk to, I just didn't even know how to kind of enter into it. And so um, I think it just, it took me a little bit longer to figure that out. But what I also know, realized is that once I did start to meet people who had careers that I really admired, they were extraordinarily helpful. And you know, I never, nobody ever shut me out of a job because I was a South Asian or because I was a woman, at least not to my face. Um, and, um, and I think if anything, at least in my field and um, in my party, uh, my diversity was generally welcomed. Um, but I think um, a lot of those barriers are things that we don't even see. You want to talk a bit about the United States of Women speech that you helped work on with President Obama? Um, sure. So um, another one of the speeches that I'm um, proud of that we worked on with the President was um, a speech that he gave to a, a summit that the White House held that we called the United State of Women, um, and it was a women. It was a speech. It was a summit, um, sort of talking about the eight years of progress that the administration had made on behalf of women and girls, and sort of what work there was to to continue. And the President gave the keynote there. And I think one of the, why I'm so proud of that speech was because he really wanted to offer a really full-throated assertion of his own feminism. And you know, we had never had a president do that. Um, and you know, he got up there and he said, this is what a feminist looks like. And he proceeded, you know, we had him sort of just knock down all kinds of, or challenge 
all kinds of stereotypes about women, all kinds of double standards, you know, from the fact that we raise our boys to be assertive and our girls to be nice, to the sexual double standard where we praise men for their sexuality and demonize women for theirs. I mean, he just went at it. And I was so proud that he was willing to do that. Um, and I thought it, it really mattered, not just to the people in the room, but it matters to young boys to hear that their president is a feminist because it changes their ideas of how they ought to be. Um, and you know, after that, he did a, a piece in Glamour magazine, an essay talking further about this. And I know Prime Minister Trudeau recently did something like that too. And I feel like it, you know, it really matters when our leaders um, are willing that this, this, and it's not just for women to stand up and say that they're feminists. It's actually really important for our male leaders too. Too. Was that a choice in the preparation of that speech that we're gonna gonna go in that direction? Yes. We're gonna we know that this is gonna cause some controversy. Yes. Yeah. Um, can you talk? Uh, do we have more we questions, have questions from the floor? We have tons of questions. Oh, great. Okay. Uh, so I have a question here from Arvand, who also coincidentally is from Brampton. Do <laughs> <laughs> you have any plan for to your uh, accommodate your thoughts for other immigrants to go up? Sorry, <coughs> I didn't. I think maybe the question was: uh, Do you have maybe a, a chart <laughs> or a pathway for other immigrants? Uh, and how they break through in, in, in uh, I guess, a democratic society? Um, well, I think that the first thing to accept is that there is no path. There's no, there's no clear path. It's not like you go to engineering school and you become an engineer, um, although if that's what you want to do, you should do it. Um, I think there's, it's accepting that there are a lot of options and a lot of ways to get somewhere, and sometimes it might feel like you move forward and then you move a little bit backwards and maybe that job isn't, doesn't seem as prestigious as you deserve, but it's what you really want to do. Um, and so I think my core sort of advice is to figure out what you want to do and then fight like hell to do it. Um, and if it's what you think will make you happy, not to ba uh, annoy the parents in the room, but if your parents don't want you to do it, you should do it anyway. Um, <laughs> if, that, if that's your dream job, if that's your dream profession, if this is the work you really care about, if that's, you know, you figured out what problem do I want to solve and this is the career that will take me there. And if that's what's going to make you happy, I just think that that's the thing you should pursue um, single-mindedly um, and be dogged in that pursuit and be confident in that pursuit. I have a question here from Parvind. Um, it's actually Brumbin. I'm um, just going to correct you there. Um, <laughs> so what was it like for you when President Obama actually went off script, and did it happen often? Um, yeah, yeah, he would, he would do his own thing. Um, well, he's, no, he's, uh, he's actually great at extemporaneous speaking. Um, and if he was going, so I think President Obama valued preparation, and so he he thought that the words that he spoke mattered, and so that's why he took a lot of care in preparing them. At the same time, he was excellent at reading an audience and could you know, easily either respond to the audience and what they were feeling, or maybe he had an additional thought, an experience he had earlier that day, and he could seamlessly weave it into a speech or you know, tell the joke that's at the top of his head or whatever. Um, but I never, it wasn't the kind of thing where you worry about him. Um, because he's so thoughtful, and whatever he's going to say is probably going to make the speech better. So, um, it, uh, no, I, I thought it was always always good. <laughs> so, I have a question from online, uh, from our Facebook Live feed, and for those watching online, feel free to leave your questions in the comments. Uh, from Nimin Baines, what advice do you have for young leaders wanting to grow in politics, when communications are becoming increasingly divisive? Hmm. Um, I think one of the reasons our communication is becoming more divisive is because of the media, the medium, right? So social media allows us to choose the news outlet that we want to get our news from and only listen to people who agree with us. And so I think that if you're somebody who is serious about public service, you need to hear from everybody and you need to break out of your echo chamber, which can be really hard to do. Um, and you, I think good communication actually starts with listening. And so you have to listen to people who maybe you don't agree with. Um, in the Obama White House, we got plenty of letters and calls from people who definitely did not agree with us. But it was so valuable to hear where people were coming from. Um, and, I, and at the same time, I think you still have to stay true to whatever your principles are. And so we don't get into public service just because we, you know, we think it's glamorous to be fighting for the piece of legislation we care about. We get into it because we want 
to make people's lives better. We want to serve our communities. And so I think it's about being true to whatever principle it was that brought you there and the values that keep you there and also listening to people who disagree with you. And it's a really tricky balance to strike, especially now. Um, but I think it's actually more important than ever that young people kind of get in and stay engaged in public service, especially when there's this cynicism about our institutions. Because if we don't do that, you know, if, if the younger generation doesn't get involved, then our institutions just atrophy. And so as difficult as it is to do those things, I think it's really critical. Do you see the potential for you to get back into public service? Uh, Definitely, I hope so. Um, I think a lot of Democrats are sort of living in exile right now, but, um, <laughs> but, but I think all of us are also still really engaged in the fight, right? So, you know, and in America, you know, women are leading the resistance. That's what's happening right now. Um, and so, um, you know, the Women's March the day after the inauguration was the single biggest demonstration in human history. And it didn't just, ha you guys had one here, right? I mean, it was, it was, all, it was all over the world. And so I think there's a lot of work to be done. And uh, you know, I'm going to do whatever I can to help Democrats take back the House in 2018 and you know, do whatever I can to, to hopefully one day take back the White House. Uh, early on, you mentioned uh, uh, portraying the president's vision and also conveying the ideals. Um, I wonder if, if there is a time in which you disagree with the, the, the president's position on something and or, or uh, you were asked to do something or, or work on a policy item that you disagree with. Uh, and I wonder how you handle that. This is maybe sounds like a cop out, but honestly, I never did. Um, I was lucky to work for a president who I agreed with on every issue I worked on with him and whose values I shared. And I, and I, I think if in, when you work for somebody in public office, that's actually really important to work for somebody who shares your values. That was a cop out. I'm going to pass the, the mic over to Rada from Bramptonist. Hi, my name is Rada Taylor with the Bramptonist. Um, dirty, guilty pleasure is editing other people's speeches. Mm. But I want to know, because you probably worked with other people as well where you didn't share the same values mm -hmm. or you didn't share the same stories, how do you know that something's going to stick? How do you know that it's going to resonate? How do you know that people are actually going to listen to that message and realize this is something I might be able to relate to. Hmm. Um, so I think you mean me mean the, what the person giving the speech to their audience, what that their audience will re resonate with their audience. Um, so I think there are a lot of sort of a lot of um, uh, factors that go into good speech writing and communicating in general. But I think two things you have to start with is what is my message that I'm trying to convey. Um, the one thing, the one idea that I'm trying to convey, what am I trying to get my audience to do or think or feel? Um, Dick Goodwin, who was um, one of uh, President Johnson's speechwriters and Kennedy, once said, um, great speech ought to move men to action and alliance, or alliance. And I will add, move men and women. Um, but, um, but that's the idea, right? So you're trying to get people to do something. But in order to do that, you need to figure out what it is. And I think too often communicators dump a lot of messages into a speech and then the, the central idea gets lost. So that's the first thing. And then the second thing is, I think it's, it's figuring out, OK, now I know I, what I want to say to them, what I want them to understand or believe. What is the, what is the thing that will persuade them as opposed to persuade me? So too often, when we, when we are talking about an issue, we'll use the language that we find persuasive from the values and perspective that we hold. But if you're trying to reach an audience that doesn't already agree with you, you need to figure out what they value. And it might be really different from you. So if I'm talking about you know, uh, gun rights, um, and I am talking about it from my values, you know, why I think that we ought to re um, have regulations on the Second Amendment in America, um, and if I only talk about it from my perspective, maybe somebody who, who uses guns is never going to agree that we need more safety measures. But if I think about it from their perspective, what, might, what values do they hold? Is it loyalty? Is it patriotism? Is it, you know, what, where are they coming from? And how can I shape this argument so that it matches their values? It's not that you're changing what you're arguing for. You're just changing how you argue for it. So there's a whole range of things that we can talk about speech writing. Um, but I think that you kind of have to start in those two places. I have a question here from Naroja. Hello, so I'm here from uh, Scarborough, the East End. So shout out to Scarborough if anyone else is here. Uh, 
I just wait, wait. I just want to say that I'm not, I'm not going to pick sides in the samosa war uh, until I actually try the samosas. But continue. <laughs> So uh, my question is around how how do you become extraordinary at speech writing? So when you look at, like, let's say Eminem, for instance, I think I heard somewhere that <coughs> he's read the dictionary cover to cover four times, like every single word. And so they're masters, right? Masters at their craft. So how do you become a master at speech writing? Practice, practice, practice. Really, I think you just keep doing it. And you work with people who are better than you so that you learn from them and then you keep practicing. And I also think that the, the key to good writing is good reading. So you have to constantly be reading, but practice. Did you ever practice in the mirror, imagining you were President Obama? Delivering a speech? <laughs> no, but I would always, I would not you know, dare to imagine that I sound like President Obama, but I would always read my speeches aloud um, because you're writing for the ear, not for the eye, and it is very easy to write something that looks beautiful pa on paper and sounds really stupid when you say it out loud. So, yeah. <laughs> I have a question here from Rose, uh, who's from the greatest city on earth, Brampton. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Um, today we're hearing unbelievable things uh, from Trump. And I was wondering, when you were working, were there lists of things, there must have been, that they said, we don't talk about this. I'm thinking maybe even, for instance, an example would be religion. Um, list of things that, it, that as a group, you wouldn't even think of, of putting in a speech. I don't know what's happened today, it's, it's the opposite. So, do you know, do you know what I mean? Uh, yes, uh, so, so no, I don't think there were any actual sort of broad topics that we stayed away from. The president actually gave at least one speech on religion every year at the National Prayer Breakfast. I work with him on several of those speeches. So a, a topic that sort of you're told to stay away from at the dinner table, no, we didn't have a list of those. What we didn't have to have a list of was things you don't say to offend people. And that's because President Obama just doesn't rock that way. Like, he's not somebody who thinks these really nasty things about people. Um, and so, candidly, we didn't have to worry about him saying things that were offensive, inaccurate, et cetera. Um, and I think that this is just a very different White House. And I think you're actually seeing White House staff kind of struggle to deal with containing him because he, his, his use of Twitter is entirely um, covered by him. And that's, that's a tough spot to be in. I think all, all great politicians know that sometimes you have to force a choice on people. Absolutely. But that's very different from choosing actively to alienate some people. Exactly. And you know, President Obama was actually a master at giving speeches that touched on some really difficult topics in America. You know, the speech he gave um, on race during the, the 2008 campaign was one of the most, you know, sort of eloquent dissertations on race in America that I've ever heard. Um, and it, it could have really gone the other way, but he was very good at sort of, again, acknowledging all sides of the issue in a way that was really empathetic and honest. And that's different from just, you know, lobbing insults at random groups. A question here from Franco. I actually have two questions. Number one, um, I've been watching what kind of happens down in the States, and I've seen both Republicans and Democrats sp not specifically mention Trump, but speak out against them. What are your thoughts on that? Speak and on what? Speak out on what President Trump is saying and doing and how, um, like, President um, W. Bush spoke out. Oh, there's a whole bunch on both sides, mm -hmm. and the, uh, the Republicans leaving um, Trump behind, basically, in the dust. Yeah. Um, so what are your thoughts on that? And Secondly, what are your thoughts on the loss of Hillary Clinton as president? Did you capture the last one? Yeah, my Here. thoughts on number two are, are too long and sad to detail. We'll have to sit down and eat a pint of ice cream to talk about it. Um, uh, uh, my thoughts on the first, um, I think it's terrific that people are speaking out. Obviously, members of my party have been speaking out for a very long time, uh, warning people about the, the dangers of Trump. Um, I think it's great that some Republicans are speaking out against him, and I hope that they will continue to do that. But I, I question whether it's truly sort of a, a brave political choice to 
denounce Trump and then say, but I'm, I'm a go now. Like, I'm going to resign. Um, and I'm not going to be part of this anymore. I think it's going to, if, if, because then you're not actually risking anything politically. Um, if you're not willing to actually run mm -hmm. on that and challenge the people in your own party. So while I admire the Republicans who are saying what they're saying, um, I'm waiting for them to actually cast votes against him. Uh, I'm waiting for them to, you know, push the congressional investigators on investigating what happened with Russia. I'm waiting for them to actually, you know, stay in their party and fight for the, the soul of it. And that's not what's happening. They're, they're resigning, um, you know, and uh, I, don't, I don't know how, how courageous that is. Um, uh, as for the loss of Hillary Clinton, uh, it was uh, catastrophic and tragic. And um, yeah, there's a lot to say there. <laughs> Another question over here. Hi, I'm Linda. Uh, thank you so much for both coming. Um, take yourself back to the first day when Marine One took off. Everything that you've learned in, up until now, uh, what could you tell your first day self? Um, I think I, I, gosh, probably just to continue to soak it in as much as possible and pinch yourself every single day. I mean, I think I appreciate it every single day, but sometimes you're working so hard and you're so focused on the task ahead of you that you forget to appreciate just where you are all the time. Um, and so I wish I had done even more of that. I feel like, you know, I'm a, I'm a history buff and I really loved the, and the history of the White House and I spent a lot of time learning about it and, and you know, walking around, but I wish I had done even more of that. Um, and I think I would have just urged myself to do even more whatever I could have done to, to, for the 2016 election. Now, now that you are where you are, are you um, people coming to you and seeing you as a, a role model? I don't know. And that's, that's scary. I mean, you're here with us today. Right. <laughs> you're my uh, role model. Over here. So you're my role model. <laughs> is, is, that, is that unusual, though, to be a behind-the-scenes person and then to be... Oh yeah. yeah, yeah, it's mortifying. Um, it's, um, I, but I, I think um, I think I'll still always be sort of a behind-the-scenes person in the sense that I'm a ghostwriter and that's what we do. Um, but to the extent that my experience is helpful in especially encouraging young people to pursue public service, um, that then then my job is done. I mean, I think that's really important, and so I just want more people to to sort of stay engaged and don't lose hope and don't you know let the cynics get you. We're in a rough period down south, but you guys, you guys are still holding on. So you know, keep keep doing what you're doing and, and staying committed to it. One last question. One last question. Then I'm good to be here with a final question. So, um, have there ever been conflicts between like what you have had to write, so like versus your personal values, like wh um, what you thought was right versus what you had to write? Yeah, uh, somebody asked that. I mean, certainly not with President Obama. I never experienced that. Um, I experienced touches of it when I was in the private sector, but it was never um, anything that I felt like I was compromising my values. And I think that if I was in that situation, I would, I would not work with that person. Um, you know, you kind of have to draw your own line. Well, I have the final question from online. Uh, and I think this is a good way to cap off the evening. Would you ever run for public office yourself? And if not, why? Oh, I would not. That does not mean that all the young people here should not consider running for office. Um, I would not because I am a staffer. I am, uh, what I like doing is the work that's behind the scenes. Um, and I especially like the work I do writing and doing communications. And so, um, and also I have no filter and, um, you know, kind of just say what I think. And so that's probably not the best way to win an election. But, um, <laughs> but uh, I understand why people don't want to run for office because it's, it's really difficult. And in America, it can be ugly. But um, there's nothing more important as far as I'm concerned right now. So. Thank you so much, Sarah, for, yeah, thanks for spending so much me. time with us. Thank you for having me. Thank you for your frankness, your generosity of uh, spirit and time and the lessons you've imparted. Uh, thanks to the mayor for giving us uh, her podium. Thanks to Mr. Davis uh, and to the elected officials for honoring us with your presence, to uh, B Dean Pam Sugerman. A special thanks to just Kieran Sandu for being our hype man and animator. <laughs> Great guy. Uh, and this event could not have happened without just Kieran, without uh, Shoaib Ahmed, without Jackie Jabson, without Mohammed Danani, without the team at Brampton Focus, the team at City Hall, 
uh, and the city of Brampton, and also the team at the Alderley Theater and all the other volunteers. So thank you very much to all of you. Uh, this is, uh, as you know, this is a presentation of the Mayor's Speaker Series and also the Ryerson Leadership Lab. And we'd like you to get involved in the work of the Ryerson Leadership Lab because this is exactly what we're intending to do, to build up leadership, to build up trust, to build up that ability to engage, learn, uh, reach across difference, and get involved. Um, so check us out on Facebook. Check out our Twitter handle, RU Lead Lab. That's RU Lead Lab, RU for Ryerson University. Follow us on Instagram and Facebook, and check out our website, www.ryersonleadlab.ca. And thanks so much for your time tonight. Great. Tell them about the workshop that's Oh, right. So if you want a master class, sorry, thank you, thank you, Shwe. Uh, so Sarah is actually uh, giving uh, some master class workshops on speech writing uh, in Toronto at, at, Roger, at the Ted Rogers School of Management at Ryerson University on Monday and Tuesday. The Monday work workshop is already sold out. There is some space in the Tuesday workshop, 8.30 to 10 come see us in the room or check us out online for those watching online uh, to register for that workshop. So with that, and I'll get into position. So with that, uh, that concludes our program here for the second Mayor's Speaker Series. Uh, Desi in the White House, Shreda, thank you very much once again. Kareem, once again, on behalf of the Mayor's Office, we thank you and the residents of Brampton. Thank you so much. I'll say stay tuned for more speaker series as we go along throughout the year. Thank you so much to Brampton Focus who made this uh, the live stream and the tech uh, that you see all around this room possible. And once again, thank you, Madam Mayor, uh, for hosting such a, such a wonderful event. With that, we sign off. Thank you so much.